and welcome for to another Omega Insight. I'm grateful that you were able to uh, join us tonight. Uh, tonight's topic is how to think. Um, I mentioned in the little uh, part to start with it, it talks about how our brain is the most important part of our body. It's the most important, it what helps us continue to function properly. And yet we don't really spend much time training our brain to think. So if we know anything about the brain, it breaks up into four different groups. There's four different types of um, parts of the brain, excuse me, <laughs> types of brains. <laughs> there's Frankenstein's, there's my, no, there's four different parts of our brain. The um, cerebellum, that's the low, that's the part that's on the brain stem and connects to the backbone. That's where the nerves run through and connects to our muscles. So that's um, our muscular structure. It helps us move, obviously is moving. That's the cerebellum. Then there's the thalamus, and this is what's connected to the five senses. So we absorb, absorb the world and observe the world, seeing, hearing, smelling, touching, and tasting. And that sends the information back to the thalamus part of the brain. The limbic system, that's connected to our emotions. And for those of us who know emotions can move us, motivate us, um, infuriate us. And I'm talking about emotions, everything from rage, love, happiness, joy, sadness, depression, all of those are the emotions. And finally, there's the cerebrum, which most of us know about. Um, it's covered by the cortex. And the cortex is the computer part of the brain. Uh, there's lots of energy happening in there. Neurons are firing across the tiny spaces there, making connections in our brain. So it gives us the feeling being tired or energetic. Um, uh, it's, it's what gives us connection to our speech and our memory. Um, it's also good for organization, inventing, creativity. All of that comes to that part of the brain. It's, um, it's where our thinking occurs. Now we work physically, we work out physically and, you know, we maintain that with some of us work out on our emotions. We work to have emotional stability and emotional intelligence. And there's even those of us who work on increasing our self-awareness with our five senses and then maybe getting a little bit of intuition in there. But not often do we work on the development of our thinking. I'm not talking about the development of our brain, but the development of our thinking. Um, it's um, the idea is to, since the brain is a muscle, if we're not developing it, it's going to atrophy just like a regular muscle. So if I don't develop my biceps, which the older I get, the less intended I am or inclined I am to do it. <laughs> but when I don't develop my muscles, they will begin to atrophy. And the same is for my brain. If I'm not working on developing my brain, exercising my brain, then it will begin to atrophy. There's lots of exercises out there that you can do for your brain to help with the development of your thinking. But I wanted to give you a couple of rules for this. And these are simple rules. It's not like you have to sit and try to figure out logical um, problems, which wouldn't be bad for you. But here's some rules to go by to help with the development of our thinking. We want to learn how to increase our thought process and, and in return, how to develop our brain, the cortex aspect of our brain. So the first rule is to refrain from using or restrain our emotions. The emotions are in the limbic part of the brain. We've already talked about that. So they should maintain themselves and be confined to the limbic system. When we are thinking rationally, emotions destroy that rational thought. So it's imperative that when I'm engaging in my cortex that I do not use the emotions. Emotions will not allow us to think rationally. I will think emotionally. And nine times out of 10, an emotional decision is the gut reaction. And it's probably not the most logical decision to do. Um, so they're very far apart. Uh, emotions are based on pleasure and anger and et cetera. But as I said, the, the mind, the logic aspect is in the cortex. So when we're making thoughts, thinking, we used to talk about the idea that when you want to make a, a decision, check with your brain first and then travel down to your heart and does your heart agree? 
it's not really the emotions, but it's like, does this feel right? That's what we often talk about. Does it feel right? So again, that's removing our emotions and making a logical choice. The next thing is to practice the difference between fact and opinion. I know we know this, but in today's society, <laughs> opinion is often glazed over like fact. It's presented as fact. Opinion is not fact. So fact is Christopher Columbus discovered America. That's a fact. Christopher Columbus was a good man. That's an opinion. So the difference is uh, like you lost your job. Fact. You lost your job. That's a fact. You deserved it is an opinion. Um, unless fact is separated from opinion, there's really no valid communication. So you're in turmoil because you're confusing fact and opinion and opinions change where facts should not. Um, zero, water will freeze at 32 degrees. That is a fact. Water is nasty tasting is an opinion. <laughs> it's not nasty. I'm drinking my water. Yay, healthy. <laughs> so that's the second thing is to remember, recognize this. And following that, it means follow evidence and not beliefs. When we're thinking logically, we follow the evidence, not what we believe. So to believe something, it's not evidence, as I've already mentioned. There was a time where people believed the earth was flat, but the evidence presumed, pr pr produced, excuse me, or provided that it was round. So you must have enough evidence to verify the position. So you have to have enough evidence to overcome a belief. That's, I know that's odd to believe, but truly, when beliefs are strong, sometimes evidence isn't enough unless it's overwhelming evidence. You have to overwhelm the beliefs that are already put into place. And, you know, the stories are definitely um, talk about how when Christopher Columbus wanted to sail and ah, the belief is it's flat, it's flat. And he couldn't get anybody to support him because he couldn't over he couldn't have the evidence or he didn't have enough evidence to provide that the earth is truly round. So you have to follow the evidence and not the belief. Here's another one that's um, good. Truth moves forward and lies move backwards. In other words, don't lie. Um, tell it like it is. So exaggeration and it misrepresents and leads to a dead end. So it's even worse to lie to yourself. Now, sometimes exaggeration is done just for drama or for jest. You know, I love this ice cream so much, I can eat a gallon of it. Well, hopefully you don't want to eat the whole gallon. And maybe you didn't. Maybe you said, oh my gosh, I love this ice cream. I ate the whole gallon when you really didn't. It was just for dramatic purposes. We understand that. But if you state it as a fact, like as in the bank, then it's a lie, especially if you didn't eat the whole gallon. You know, um, you get the idea. So remember, when you're dealing with the truth, the truth, exaggeration, as long as it's not connected to opinion, I'm sorry, to fact, then we could state it as an opinion, as if I can eat a gallon. I loved ice cream so much. It's as if I can eat a gallon a day rather than I can eat a gallon a day. Although some people probably could eat a gallon a day. Maybe you might be able to say a ton. <laughs> Then you want to talk about the difference between concrete and abstract. Now, this is really important, and this is a really good way to develop your brain. When something is concrete, and can be seen and touched. This is a water bottle. It can be seen and touched. The abstract world cannot be seen and touched. So what is is concrete. Abstract is what if. That's where we can theorize and we can spend time contemplating different um, realities. Uh, you know, how will the world be in 20 years from now? That's abstract thinking. We don't have any concrete evidence, but we can be abstract. The benefit of being abstract is it's creativity. It can help us prepare for the future. When I'm being abstract thought process, what will my life be like when I retire? And where will the places, well, if I want to go to travel, well, then I know right now, concretely, I better start saving money in order to be able to do all said travel. <laughs> uh, this is another really good one. Words must be accurate. Now, for those of you who know me, I stumble around words sometimes, or I even make up words um, in, in jest and I laugh, but I do know the significance of words. Words have vibrations 
if I'm choosing the appropriate word for the appropriate thought, that's congruency with my thinking. And it's also very moving. When we use words that are not pronounced well, or they're not in the, in the clear context, it could be taken out of context. Um, I think about when public speakers, they choose their words, the scripts are written and they're rewritten and edited and rewritten until it's sharp. And then the public speaker will, will memorize that word so that when they're delivery, it's just as sharp as the word. This is why people practice public speaking. At times, speaking off the cuff is more relatable, but when we're wanting to deliver um, a subject or a um, thought process or an idea, and we want to, like for um, scientists who want to propose a theorem, it's important to use the correct words and terminology. Now I know that there's the slang and back in the day we used to have the conversation about the slang, is it appropriate, is it not appropriate? Well, you're just hanging out with your friends, of course slang's good, not a problem. But when it infiltrates into your day-to-day -day speaking, and I know this, um, working in training and development, dealing with the younger generation, the generation that grew up texting, so you're not even finishing complete sentences, everything's abbreviated, becomes a little bit difficult to communicate with. So choosing the correct word and not to diminish anyone, sometimes the text is easier <laughs> than having the conversation, but to use our words accurate, it's appropriate. Every word has an appropriate definition. So to use that word appropriately actually connects our brain with our thinking and our speaking. And we are far more um, magnetic, I would say, when it comes to that. Another rule is to remember that no two things are ever the same. Remember Dr. Seuss, you know, the two things, these are two things, but no two things are ever the same. Even identical twins are different. So assumptions, we must be careful of assumptions when we think, oh, well, this is the way it is. So that's the way it's always going to be. Um, it's foolish to think that always the same thing is always going to be the same. Oh, I did this before. So it's always going to be the same. There's always different elements. That's what makes Omega so good. Even though we run through the same schedule, the people are different. And of course, those of you who know me, I love to tell the story about the um, pool table. I won't belabor it to you, but there's an idea that the people in the room make a difference. So every time we do a class, even though the schedule is the same, it's never going to be the same program. I've been doing Omega since 1990. So 33 years, and I've never had an identical experience in a class. And some are close. Some are very similar, but never identical. So walking in with the fresh perspective that this is going to be new keeps me awake and not being lazy, it makes me alert and um, being more in the present moment rather than, oh gosh, this is another lecture, blah, 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 blah. That's one of the reasons why colleges, unfortunately, are a struggle for some students because the um, professors have lost their spark. It's become rote and they're just regurgitating information rather than inspiring individuals, not all professors, but there are some instances of that. Speaking of colleges, then the next rule would be to prepare to change your mind. Just because it is that is now doesn't mean it's always going to be that way. So change my mind, being open to changing my mind, being open. I read a quote today, um, minds, books, and umbrellas must be open in order to be useful. <laughs> I think that's great. So be prepared to change my mind. Um, the truth is relative. I love this one. The thought of the truth is relative. And I always go to that image of two people standing and there's a, a letter on the ground. So this person sees a number nine and this person sees the number six. Who's right? It's relative. If you're standing from this person's position, that's a nine. If you're standing from this person's position, that's a six. So not only do we have to think relative, but we also respect the opposite point of view because they are seeing it from another point of view. So relative and respect. And the last thing I want to mention is deductive and inductive logic. Excuse me, inductive. And yes, I did inductive and deductive logic. So deductive logic works like this. Cowboys wear hats. John wears a cowboy hat. Therefore, therefore, John is a cowboy. That's very poor logic. Inductive logic says cowboys wear hats. Excuse me, cowboys wear cowboy hats. John wears a cowboy hat, therefore it's a probability that John is a cowboy. So again, deductive logic, 
cowboys wear cowboy hats. John wears a cowboy hat. Therefore, John's a cowboy. That's it. That's poor logic. Where inductive logic is cowboys wear cowboy hats. John wears a cowboy hat. There's a probability that John is a cowboy, but it actually works better with numbers. If we say 3% of the population are cowboys, most cowboys wear cowboys hats. John wears a cowboy hat. Then there's a 3% probability that John is a cowboy. So that's the rules for thinking. I hope I didn't overdo it and blow your brains here. <laughs> but the idea is to be able to work the muscle of my cortex, to work that brain so that I will be able to expand my capacity. Um, again, keeping I love the ideas of keeping an open mind, restraining my emotions, opinion versus fact, concrete versus um, concrete versus abstract, excuse me, opinion versus fact. No two things are ever the same. Always being open, the truth is relative. So thank you for joining me this evening. I truly appreciate it. I look forward to seeing you for the next time that we meet. Until then, have a beautiful rest of your day. And as always, thank you for keeping the spirit of Omega alive. Bye now.